Well, thank you and welcome. It's really a pleasure to look out and see all of you here today. Uh, today is USC's official beginning of commencement week. But for us in the Rossier School, this lecture is a capstone on a day focused on teachers and teacher development. For those graduates of our Master of Arts in Teaching program, better known as the MAT, today is Trojan Pride Day, a day that began with a lunch um, welcoming graduates from around the, camp, around the country to our campus. In addition, we have had numerous activities focused on helping our MAT graduates find a teaching position in a very tough employment environment. But thanks to their membership in the Trojan family, we hope that they've learned some ways to find a teaching position that matches their strengths. Now for the others in the audience, while you are not likely to be an MAT graduate, you are likely to have been inf influenced by a teacher, hopefully more than one. I know that each one of you could tell a story about a teacher who had a significant impact on your school years or on your choice of a career or on your outlook on life. A teacher who not only taught you, but changed you for the better. At the Rossier School, one of our goals is to graduate that kind of teacher. We're very fortunate today to have with us one of the premier American scholars uh, in the field of teaching and teachers. Susan Moore Johnson is the Jerome T. Murphy Professor in Education at Harvard University. In that capacity, she studies and teaches about teacher policy, organizational change, and administrative practices. Dr. Johnson is herself a former high school teacher and administrator, and has a continuing research interest in the work of teachers and the reform of schools. She has studied the leadership of superintendents, the effects of collective bargaining on schools, the use of incentive pay plans for teachers, and the school as a context for adult work. In her book, Finders and Keepers, Dr. Johnson presents the experiences of, her, of first and second year teachers and sounds an urgent call to put an end to finger pointing and to make teaching a sustainable career. Dr. Johnson's project on the next generation of teachers continues to examine how best to recruit, support, and retain a strong teaching force in the next decades. The project, which is funded by several foundations, includes studies of hiring practices, alternative certification programs, new teachers' attitudes towards careers, and new teachers' experiences with colleagues. When Professor Moore finishes her remark, pardon me, when Professor Moore Johnson uh, finishes her remarks, we have a panel led by our own faculty member, Dr. Sandy Kaplan, and then after the panel we'll have time for a few questions. So to deliver her thoughts on the role and importance of today's teachers, please help me welcome to USC, Dr. Susan Moore Johnson. Hello, thank you very much. Karen, thank you for inviting me today to this um, very important celebration and event. Um, I've had a, a wonderful day yesterday and today um, and have seen your campus for the first time. I understand some of you are seeing it for the first time as well. So we're enjoying a treat. Um, last night I was given this uh, phenomenal USC cap. So my hat is off to you. I understand the Dalai Lama wore one recently here. So I figured I, I could do that too. Um, so I'm here to congratulate you and to uh, talk with you about a few lessons that we have learned from our research that might help you um, launch your successful and satisfying career in teaching. One of the interesting things about researchers is we sort of come to things late. Um, and the economists uh, have finally concluded what parents and teachers and students have long known that the teacher is the single most important school level factor in a student's success, and that having a series of ineffective teachers can leave a student woefully behind, while having a series of effective teachers can make the difference between being a dropout and going to college. And that's only the effect that tests can measure, since that's how the economists do their work. Um, it doesn't take into account the kind of personal influence 
uh, of an inspiring teacher, the kind that, that uh, Dean Gallagher was talking about, whose words of confidence really echo through a lifetime. And as teachers, we never know how far those echoes go. So who one's teachers are, whether they know their subject, know how to teach it, care about their students, and are determined to see them learn. All that matters to all students in the schools, but especially to students who live in low-income and urban and rural communities. We know that teachers matter more for those students. If education is to deliver on its promise for the children in this nation, then our teachers must be outstanding. But we also know that their success, your success, will depend not only on your individual commitment and effort and all that you've learned up to now, but also on your schools and what you make of them and what they make of you. I became interested in what we call the new generation of US teachers in 1998. My daughter Erica was graduating from a liberal arts college and deciding what to do next. From my perspective, not deciding quickly enough. <laughs> for her, as for many of you, I guess, um, education is the family business. My dad, her grandfather, was a lifelong teacher, as were my great aunts. My brother and I are both in education, having started out with careers in teaching. And Erica thought perhaps she might do something else. Why be a teacher like everyone else? Maybe a psychologist like her father. Um, she met with the recruiters who came to her college, um, who were waiving signing bonuses at the time. That time has changed, as you know. Uh, they were representatives of consulting companies and investment banks and technology firms. But none of them really interested her. I bought her a nice jacket for her interviews. I know that she never wore it once. Um, teaching kept tugging at her. But she didn't want to spend another year in school learning to teach. It was going to cost her money and time. And um, so she held off on that. But then the recruiter came to campus that, that uh, got her attention. And that was Teach for America. And um, it offered her the chance to explore teaching at little cost, she thought. So she signed up. And I've come to think of this as the way that the child of an education professor rebels, not needing anything that I have committed my professional life to. Um, just by the way, if you're wondering whether it was worth your time and money to do all this, to, to get your MAT, it definitely was. After three years in TFA, she, uh, where she was actually assigned to teach first grade bilingual based on her high school Spanish, uh, she returned to graduate school full time to, uh, to really learn how to teach reading. And she taught for a number of years after that, now is back in graduate school. At the time, I was, I was struck by the differences between Erica's cohort that was entering teaching at that time and my own cohort of teachers who'd started to teach in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, we, as a cohort, are about to retire, and we are what are called the veterans when you read about us in the newspaper. Um, we are different generations, yours and mine, not only in age. We have different expectations, different opportunities, and different aspirations. Uh, these differences, which have come about because of the time in which uh, we became teachers, have actually far-reaching implications for students in schools and for you as teachers entering your new career. Since 1998, uh, when my cohort began to retire, the shape of the teaching force has been increasingly U-shaped with a large group of veteran teachers about to retire and a large group of new teachers entering. And for demographic reasons, there's a kind of gap in between, which we've called the, the generation gap. And this U-shaped pattern can be seen nationally in the data, locally in the data of a district, but also within schools. You'll see a group of more experienced teachers, less experienced teachers, and few in between. So, 
seeing that in some of the big numbers, in 1998, my doctoral students and I set out to study 50 new teachers in Massachusetts. And this is the basis of the Finders and Keepers book that, that uh, Dean Gallagher mentioned. These teachers came from a variety of preparation programs, alternative and traditional, and taught in a range of schools uh, in, in various settings, all public schools but charter public as well as traditional public. And we followed them over full, four years. We wanted to know why they entered teaching. What were they interested in, given all of those recruiters who were out there asking them to do other things? What did they expect in a career in teaching? And what did they find in their schools? What were schools doing that might help them succeed as teachers or perhaps fail as teachers? What lessons might all this provide for new teachers like you? After four years, we found that their decisions about a teaching career um, mirrored pretty closely the national statistics. 17 of the 50 were in their original schools, 16 had transferred to new schools, but were still in teaching, and 11 had left public school teaching altogether. So we studied what was behind those decisions, and we learned a lot about them as individuals and about their schools as context for their teaching. The new generation of teachers that you're joining, and you really are, I know we do Generation X and Y and where you born in July and where you fit on that line, but you are part of this new group, um, are, are, your joining differs in important ways from mine. You work in a job market with many options. Now I know right now there aren't a lot of jobs, but still the larger job market, career market, has many opportunities. Teaching and nursing are not your only choices, and they were essentially the only choices to women and to men of color in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, in fact, many of the professions and institutions that were closed to pr prospective teachers in my generation now recruit them, and the very individuals they would have rejected 34 or 30 or 40 years ago now are on the top of their hiring list. It's a very different setting. Um, notably, the occupations that compete for your talent with teaching um, offer, uh, often offer better working conditions, opportunities for career advancement, um, higher pay, performance-based pay, uh, many more options than most schools have in the past. And for the first time in history, public education is really having to compete for talent. Um, if education is not competing right now for your talent because of the budget cuts, um, it will. And when the economy recovers or when inevitably my generation really does retire, the jobs will be there. Um, and it, we have to retire, right? Something will happen. Um, <clears throat> we've learned from our work that in the new generation of teachers, there are not only first career entrance to teachings, that is straight out of college, but also a large number of what we call mid-career entrants, career switchers. Um, the the mid-career entrants have entered teaching after a substantial period of time in another line of work. Um, they have, as a group, an average age of about 35 as opposed to 25 in the first career entrance. And they now constitute 38% of the nation's new teachers, which is a very, very high percentage. It's doubled, essentially, in 20 years. And I'm guessing that you have, uh, in your midst, similar uh, entrance to teaching. Uh, it's such a large group that we have to think differently about this cohort of new teachers. Mid-career entrants have come to teaching, we learn, in search of more meaningful work. Uh, they have tired of uh, being in the airports of the world repeatedly, uh, having to carry all sorts of gear to keep in touch with their bosses, and they want to work with kids. They enrich schools with what they've learned on the job, Things like how physics is used in developing flight simulators, how the First Amendment is protected in courtrooms. Uh, these are the kinds of real life connections with um, curriculum that students love and can learn from. Many mid-career entrants have raised their own children, feel confident about their personal authority, although as one new teacher who is a, a mother of four admitted, the real deal is real different. So she wasn't quite so sure she had all that classroom management in hand. Um, mid-career entrants have known other types of organizations, and this is really important. 
I, like some of you, went from school to school to school and back to school. I was in classrooms one year after another. Um, people who have worked at IBM tell me that when things don't work well there, they reorganize, they do things differently. But some of us have been in school so long we can't really see what a different approach would be. New teachers also have uh, both a short-term, uh, individuals have either a short-term or a long-term commitment to teaching. It, it, in the 60s and 70s, we were making a long-term commitment to teaching. Not only teachers, but bankers. You know, a banker was a banker for life, and the bank to which that banker was connected had the same name for 10 years, 20 years. You know, there's a kind of continuity. New generation of teachers and new generation of um, professionals actually think about teaching differently. One of the long-termers in our group who saw teaching as a lifelong career said, I just always knew I was going to be a teacher. I assume that this is what my career will be for life. People change careers so many times, or the average person does, but I don't expect to. Of the 50 new teachers we interviewed, only 17 said they planned to stay in education long term, and only three first career entrants planned to remain in the classroom full time for an entire career. So it was just sort of remarkable numbers. Now they were guessing about their futures, and they were guessing at a time when they thought there were opportunities everywhere. But it is a really different perspective. This comment from a short-termer was typical of those expressed by 33 of the teachers we interviewed. I'm a career changer. He was a mid-career entrant. I'm a career changer. I figured, why not explore a new field? My guess is that I'll need to have a success, sense of success in order to stay. And if I feel that way, I'll probably stick with it. If not, I can return to software development. So this uh, tentative commitment to education means that schools and school districts have to think very differently about retention. And that's a whole new thing, a whole new topic since the year 2000. Um, the, uh, because of the way that schools were organized and administered in the late 60s and early 70s, when veteran teachers today began, began their career, teachers of my generation tend to have certain preferences about their schools, and you read about these. They prefer the privacy, we prefer the privacy of our classroom, autonomy in our teaching, equal treatment and standardized pay, and career development that focuses on refining and deepening instructional skills rather than taking them out of the classroom and having broader influence. By contrast, the teachers of the new generation have expectations and priorities that are quite different. And again, remember, we have these two groups of teachers in schools now at the same time with these competing priorities. This is what I'm about to say has also been confirmed recently in a big survey done by the American Federation of Teachers and the American Institutes of Research. So you're accustomed to working in teams and the prospect of privacy that leads to isolation may in fact trouble you. You want flexible roles. The idea of being confined to the same exact role for 40 years is incomprehensible. You want early opportunities for advancement, whatever that means, not necessarily to be a principal, but some way of showing that you're developing. And you'd like your influence to extend beyond the classroom. And many of you would probably like pay that reflects your performance, though figuring out how to do that is a big challenge. So we have these very, you, don't, you may not fit that pattern, but broadly, those are the difference, differences. The schools of today are organized, really were shaped and are organized in keeping with my generation's priorities. Um, if you are to be satisfied, and more importantly, I think if your students are to be well educated, then those schools will have to change. And at the ri risk of uh, increasing your professional burdens today, I'd say that you will have to change them. So. Um, we wanted to know what it was that new teachers experience led, why new teachers experience led some to remain in teaching and feel confident about their success while others changed schools or left. And the answer from our perspective was unequivocal. What happened to these teachers in their school 
shape their choices. Not the district, not the state, not the federal government, but what experience they had in their schools. So while you matter enormously as individuals, the schools where you teach will have a tremendous influence on what you can do there. And the success or failure that you achieve there is not all up to you personally. It's shared by others and by that organization. Today, though, as I said, schools tend still to be organized like egg cartons. Teachers work alone in the compartments of their classrooms with their assigned students rather than teams. I know that many of you, even though you've been involved in this program where you've been studying at a distance, have been working on teams since you played soccer at age five, and you had group projects at age 10, and you had group projects in college, and you're accustomed to working on teams. Um, so thinking about the fit of you and your expectations and the schools where you're entering is really important. And to think about that school as something that actually can improve and can be changed. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we have in schools, in addition to the cubicles, is that teachers' roles are the same, that their pay is the same. Not the same, but uniform on a standardized salary scale. Uh, and that the careers that are available as teachers, as classroom teachers, do not offer expanded influence or recognition over time. There are some very promising programs in districts such as Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Montgomery County, Maryland, that are developing uh, career ladders that have real substance and, and meaning to them. So it's not as if this is not all in the works, but you may not find it in the school where you work. Schools have to become organizations that make good teaching not only possible, which it's always been, but likely. Um, and I think really importantly, the kinds of schools that new teachers of your generation are seeking, the more interdependent, team-based, supportive environments, are actually the same kind that our students need. Because students don't just go from one classroom where things are good to another classroom where things are good. They move through a school and they experience it as a unit. So I'd like to focus on four challenges briefly that you'll face in getting started and um, so that offer some suggestions that are drawn from our research about how you might approach them. The first one is choosing a job. And I know some of you met with uh, superintendents for advice. Um, I would <clears throat> urge you to talk about choosing a job and not finding a job. It sort of creates a whole different way of thinking about it. I'd urge you to search for a school where you think that you can succeed with the students there. So schools offer different things. What does it, this school where you might work offer new teachers? Is it an orderly place for teaching and learning? Because if it isn't, then you probably are not personally going to be able to create all that order yourself. Do you have colleagues whose work you respect and you think you can learn from and who want to work with you? Um, schools that maintain positive relationships with parents in the community make it a whole lot easier to do that for the kids and the parents in your classroom. These are the kinds of organizational questions that you should be asking. There's good research that suggests that if people have a good preview of the work they take on, even if that work is extremely challenging, they are more likely to stay and succeed than if they're surprised by it. So I would therefore urge you to go for what we are hoping always will be information-rich interviews, rather than a quick, uh, do you meet my criteria, I need you tomorrow, sign on. Um, our research with um, surveying teachers in four states, asking about their hiring, this is work that I did with um, Ed Liu, who was a student of mine. Um, we found that uh, overall, a third of them had been hired over a month before school started, like now or June or maybe July. A third were hired in the month before school started, and a third were hired after school started. So this timing thing about finding a job, if you're anxious, that was in normal times. 
And so you have to know that things will be very, very fluid through the easy days of summer, and you're going to be out there looking. So don't jump. Don't take something just because it's there. And don't take something where someone offers you it in the moment when you haven't had a chance to find out about it. <clears throat> My second piece of advice is that you not accept a teaching assignment unless it's reasonable. I'm not saying ideal. I'm saying reasonable. You've heard it said that teaching is the only career where you do the same work on the first day of your career as the last, you know, that grim kind of prediction. Well, in fact, we found that for new teachers, the assignment on their first day is likely to be harder than any other assignment they'll have. As a group, the teachers we studied taught the lowest tracks, the split grades, and the largest and most challenging classes. At a time when state tests in Massachusetts were administered in only three grades and two subjects, 39% of our teachers were assigned the tested classes. Um, it is very important that you take on an assignment that's manageable for you. And having, you know, half your program be in English, half in social studies, across two grades, it is probably not reasonable. Or if you're going to take it on, know that it's going to be very hard and know that you may not succeed in all parts of it um, initially. Um, resist out-of-field placements. Richard Ingersoll from Penn University of Pennsylvania has done some great research about out-of-field placements. You know, you had that one math class, and they use it, and you're supposed to teach math. It's one of the great achievements of No Child Left Behind, that there has to be some attention to whether people are really qualified to teach what they have to teach. So in this time, when there's a lot of stress about finding a job, Think very carefully before you accept one where you feel this is way beyond what's reasonable or what I can do. My third has to do with a curriculum. Find and use a curriculum. I was actually just this afternoon reading a paper submitted to a journal about new teachers. And they were teachers working in a school where the princ principal LE of the school was that all teachers would create their own curriculum. I would like to say that for first year teachers that is utterly ridiculous. And <clears throat> that you shouldn't imagine that that is a worthy goal um, or a fair responsibility. So find a curriculum, either one that's provided by your school or district, one that's used by other teachers you respect or recommended by teachers in other setting, your cohort here for example. A curriculum is not simply a list of topics, but it includes textbooks and resources, units, even lesson plans in each subject. Virtually none of the teachers we studied could count on that in every subject that, that they taught. Most had materials for one or two subjects um, or classes, and they had to develop plans day by day, often for courses they knew nothing about. One of our teachers talked about being lost at sea, trying to develop a curriculum. Another called curriculum development a mad scramble uh, and that was left to the individual teacher. There is a lot of good curriculum available now. It has been developed in the last 10 years with standards-based assessments in mind, and um, it, it's available online. But don't imagine that if you're to be a true teacher, you have to make it all up from day one, unless, of course, you don't need to sleep. And even then, I'm not sure that that will work. So things have improved since we have interviewed these teachers. Uh, so it, there is much more out there, but there still is the belief among some that teachers should create it all. Um, the next piece of advice I have is that you build day-to-day -day working relationships with your colleagues. Now, what I'm about to say next is controversial, but there's good research behind me. I have very little confidence in one-to-one -one mentoring for new, new teachers. If you're lucky and you're assigned an effective mentor and your mentor teaches the same subject and grade that you do and you get along and it's the kind of style of teaching you would like to emulate, that's good and you're lucky. 
Um, but don't count on it. I'm, I'm accustomed to saying that the survival rate of marriages in our country is 50%. I don't know why we imagine that these kind of random assignments of mentors should somehow miraculously make your life as teachers. And, and the problem, of course, is that if you're led to believe that your mentor will provide your future, then you don't pay attention to the person next door, down the hall, the group of teachers in your grade level, who actually are the people that you'll be working with most closely, and from whom you can draw a lot of different lessons um, and experiences. Um, we asked our teachers uh, whom we interviewed how often they interacted with their colleagues, what they talked about, what they learned, what they needed from them. We tried to figure out what their cohort, what their cluster uh, of colleagues was, what the, what the group was. It was often a grade level, um, a cluster in the middle school, part of a department or a whole department in the high school, and occasionally in very small schools it was an entire school. So we asked them to describe a lot of that, and then we analyzed their interviews really closely and decided that the teachers generally worked in one of three kinds of professional cultures with these groups. We call them veteran-oriented, novice-oriented, or integrated professional cultures. So I, I want to briefly tell you what those are. Um, the veteran-oriented veteran -oriented professional cultures typically had a high proportion of veteran teachers, no surprise. These were experienced teachers. Some of them were very effective and some were not. So this is not the Deadwood veterans, they just were all very experienced teachers. Um, whatever their competence, their patterns of practice were very well established. They had defined how work was going to be done in the school. Sometimes they decided we don't need faculty meetings anymore and the new teachers were left without any place to convene with other teachers. Their professional habits were not organized to engage new teachers um, or to appointment, acquaint them with the practices of expert teachers. That doesn't mean they were mean. The new teachers were invited to the welcomes and the parties and the breakfasts and all that, but they didn't get a good look at what they were doing in their classrooms. Um, Brenda, for example, and she is one of the saddest examples in our, in our study. She taught 210 students Spanish in grades seven and eight um, and had 10 different sections. So her assignment was a setup for failure. But she also worked in a veteran-oriented uh, culture. Other teachers I've found sometimes to be supportive. I think there's only so much they can do, though, as far as being supportive because they all have their own classes and their time is so, so busy also. It's hard to be able to talk to other teachers more than just like passing in the lunchroom. Like most teachers are just gone at 2.30. They're just gone. And they've set things up in such a way that maybe like after years and years of doing it, they don't have to plan as much or they have their systems down for homework and it's just easy. By contrast, dramatic contrast, novice-oriented professional cultures could be found in grade levels or clusters, but for us most often in startup charter schools or reconstituted or what we call turnaround schools now where large numbers of teachers leave or are asked to leave and new folks come in. Um, teachers working in novice-oriented professional cultures were often highly committed, very strong ideology about how kids can learn and how important the work is, very hard working, um, didn't need to sleep, I must say. Um, but they had no way to draw on the expertise of experienced teachers because they were all so new. Mary, who taught in a startup charter school, said, it's a new staff. I would say we're all a young staff. Not that many experienced teachers. It's sort of an intense kind of energy there. People are really committed to children. There's a big focus on creating your own curriculum because there's a sense that nothing else out there works, that all these other schools have failed. I've talked to really experienced teachers from other schools. These are people who've worked in the classroom for a long time. And not everything maybe is perfect, but a lot of what they're doing is working. And we reject all that, I think. And as a new teacher at a new school, I feel we reject it too easily. So we don't benefit by that, you know. And as a result, you're sort of left floundering. There was, there, well, that's the end of the quote. There was lots of energy at that school. 
but little professional guidance, and Mary was troubled by that. In the third professional culture, which we called integrated, there were no separate camps of veterans and novices. New teachers were assigned to work closely with experienced teachers. So a new teacher would be in a grade level with three other experienced teachers, or maybe another new teacher and two experienced teachers. It was a kind of mixing up um, that occurred rather than having grades or subjects or courses captured by certain groups of teachers. New teachers were assigned to work closely with experienced teachers, and there was sustained support and exchange across experience levels. The particular needs and talents of new teachers were recognized and met, and there was a shared sense of responsibility throughout the school for the school, for the students, and the teachers, for all the teachers. Fred, who worked with teams of both grade level and subject teachers, described such a professional culture in his, his school. So we have a nice blend of veteran teachers who've been in the system for a long time and know the art of teaching. And then we also have a nice core of four or five young teachers like myself with less than five years of teaching experience. And that creates a really good atmosphere. So I think the young teachers learn from the veteran teachers and I think the veteran teachers get sparked a little from the young teachers coming in, you know, a new fresh attitude. So it's mutually enriching in that sense. So you can't have a school that's too heavy either way, I don't think. So after um, one year, the effects of the differences in these professional cultures were really uh, very clear. Teachers who worked in what we had called integrated professional cultures based on their description were far more likely to have remained in teaching and in their original schools. 82% were there than the novice-oriented professional cultures who remained in their schools at 67% or the veteran-oriented professional cultures at 57%. A lot was going on in those integrated schools, not just that the teachers were working together, but it's really something that I hope you'll keep in mind that you need uh, to pay attention to that. So my advice is look for schools and teaching assignments that are likely to engage you day to day, working with colleagues who have different levels of experience and expertise and teaching styles. Seek out their advice and their help routinely. If you do have a mentor, your mentor does not own you. And in school cultures, this peculiar things happen where if Karen's my mentor, I dare not go to someone else and no, no, no one else will come to me and offers help because I'm sort of supposed to be working with her. Don't believe that. Um, observe and ask to be observed. The new teachers we interviewed so wanted to have people in their classes giving them feedback, any feedback, good feedback, bad feedback, whatever. Check out other people's classes. Follow the students you teach into someone else's class. It's amazing what you can learn just in 20 minutes of watching someone else teach. Participate in school-wide planning committees. Don't imagine that you have to wait till you're there five years to participate in that. And do not wait in your classroom for help because if that's the situation, help may not arrive. So together, do your job search assiduously, enthusiastically, keeping in mind that what you need is what you need to find. Don't jump at the first offer, uh, and pay particular attention to your assignment. Uh, an out-of-field placement in a very well-regarded school may get a lot of oohs and ahs from your friends, but it may be a setup for failure as far as you're concerned. Find somewhere and use a curriculum, modifying it as you like. Uh, teachers always would tell us, scripted curricula, I don't mind, give it to me. I'll decide, I don't have to use it. As long as you're not monitoring my every move, I love the resources. So modify it as you like, and hopefully um, you'll be doing that with your colleagues during common planning time. Try to work closely with colleagues, uh, those with very varying levels of expertise and experience, and get out of your classroom and watch others teach. So no matter how lucky you are, and no matter what you do, I want to tell you, you will not change the world in one or two years. You may change some children's lives, and that's no small matter, but you're not going to change the world. Jim Kelly, who founded the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, once said to me, don't try to boil the ocean, just do one thing right. 
And I guess I would say to you, it's an enormous task you're taking on. And you will not be a master of that um, probably in one year, two years, or three years. That doesn't mean you can't be good and effective at it. But if you approach it realistically uh, and looking for support and help, you'll have a much better chance. The goal is to begin a career in education that will deepen and develop over time, no matter how long you choose to stay in teaching. I know as well as you do that it's not easy to be a teacher today. This has probably been the worst few months for teachers in the press that I have ever seen. Um, and, and it's really, really hard. Often, um, others, even those in your own family, even those in your own family who teach, will ask you why you choose such challenging work uh, that brings so little public recognition and such modest pay. But I can say with certainty that teaching can be the most inspiring and rewarding work there is. It is certainly the most important work to the children uh, of our country. So on behalf of your students and our society, I congratulate you and I wish you well. Thank you, Susan. That was terrific. And to build on your remarks, and as maybe a bridge to uh, in, uh, engage the, the audience, we're going to ask uh, Sandy Kaplan to come up with her panel of students, soon to be graduates, and come on up here. And uh, they're going to talk about some of the, the uh, points that uh, Dr. Johnson made. And we're going to ask uh, also Dr. Johnson to come on up. It'll be about 15 minutes, and then we'll get to get your comments and your questions. So come on up. And Sandy, will you introduce your, or have them introduce themselves? What we'd like to do in this time frame is to give our students a chance to ask questions. But before they do so, I'd like to be able to have them answer the question that is probably most important for them, and that is, why did you want to become a teacher? And what have you done in this process to really develop your skills to become such? We have um, one person who graduated many years ago and has had at least five years of experience. We have one that is graduating tomorrow and um, well, on Friday. And then someone I don't know who will introduce herself as well. So, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of having two of them as students, and actually um, Michelle, who's in the green, as not only a student, but as also an individual who's been very active in training teachers herself. And so it's been kind of fun to watch her evolution as an individual and as a professional. Okay, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us what you've been doing and where you teach. Sure. Can you, I, you, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? No? no. Yes, now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michelle McGuire. Um, currently, I'm a fifth grade teacher, and I teach right across the street. I think it's this way, at the Alexander Science Center School. Um, I've been there since I graduated the MAT program. So. If all goes well and I'm back there next year, that will be my seventh year teaching. And uh, the reason why I wanted to be a teacher is because <clears throat> my mother inspired me. She wasn't a teacher professionally or, or in, in any sense, but everything we did together was about learning. And I thought it was just the most amazing thing to every day live your life learning. And, <clears throat> excuse me. I just get emotional because she's great. Um, I want that for all children, 
Why is it that I'm the only one in my mind who got that experience? I wanted to carry that on for children who may not have families that are so supportive. And I, I think that's imperative for our children, for our country, for our communities to, to be able to give those experiences to children. So that's why I became a teacher. And I love it dearly. And I love those kids. So. Uh, hello, my name is Mary Beth Kretke, and I am will be walking to, on Friday. Um, I finished the program in um, February, uh, at the end of February, and then started substituting for a Torrance Unified School District. And then we'll see <laughs> what happens next. Um, I became a teacher, well, I should say my background is actually in theater. My undergraduate degree was in drama, and I moved out to LA with stars in my eyes. And I, I quickly realized that why I love theater is because I get to tell stories and hopefully inspire others. And I quickly <laughs> realized that that wasn't necessarily a, a opportunity I was going to have working in the entertainment industry, perhaps. But I, I, I'm, t I'm too much of a hard worker to wait for that to happen. I have to take control of my own, my own choices. and so. Um, my mother is a teacher, so I also have, actually, she told me not to go into f teaching, um, which made me want to teach even more. Um, but I, because of that, you know, I, I, I decided that because I love history, I love storytelling, I, I needed to take that performance that I love to do and, and inspire children every day. And I see, for me, what better audience has the open mind and who still believes in impossibilities of, than children. Um, so that's how I view it, is I perform every day in a classroom, but my audience has homework. And <laughs> I, but I, I think it's very transferable in terms of my script is my lesson plan, and, and my stage is my classroom. So that's where I am. Please. Yeah, um, my name is Hannah McDowell, and I graduated last year from the MIT program. I'm also uh, a member of Math for America Los Angeles. I teach uh, algebra, high school algebra, um, in a public high school in East LA. And it's my very first year teaching, so I graduated last year, it's my first year teaching. I, I decided to become a teacher. I was actually also a theater major. Oh, okay. I like that. <laughs> so I enjoyed the performance aspect of it as well. Um, but I studied both math and theater in college, and what struck me, I think my most memorable college experience was um, working in a public school in Northeast uh, Los Angeles and realizing what a roadblock algebra is to student success. And it was kind of shocking to me in a lot of ways, seeing like the correlations between dropout rates and algebra. And um, I love math. I think it's just the most fun thing in the world. So it's like, oh, if I could communicate that to students in a way that would make sense with them and resonate with them, I would just be over the moon, so that's why I became a teacher. <laughs> As I were listening to Dr. Moore Johnson's um, speech and her talking about um, teacher effectiveness, one of the things I'd like you to think about in terms of responding to what she was saying was what you have learned about teacher effectiveness as you matriculated through our program and how that might um, just oppose with the kinds of comments that she made. Um, well, I'll start. Because um, one of the things that really stood out to me was your comment on the the one to one mentor. I know that was later on, but it but it made so much sense because I feel like at USC one of the big theories that we learn about is social cognitive of, and socio cultural theories and that idea that you have to have a group and there's one on one is good it it has its purpose um, but you're you don't get to practice with one on one. Um, you need that team to actually get the different ideas flowing and, and everything. So that's what really resonated with me because I feel like if we are now taught to go do that with our students and to have group work and to, you know, desks moved into fours, why would you do that as, as you approach later on? So I took that as very much a good advice for the future of don't be tied down one on one. I think something that <clears throat> came to my mind was I went back to my student teaching experiences and the first semester we had partner um, teachers and 
I, I didn't realize it at the time, but really it groomed me for the way that I interact with my own colleagues. And you know, we, you talk numerous times about the context. Um, in which we're in in the schools, and you can either be in that egg crate and be an autonomous teacher, or you can try and be sorry, um, more integrated. And just that experience of having to share those struggles, those successes, uh, the failures with another person uh, really opened me up for how I wanted to enter into my workplace. And also, really what you said about uh, not just picking whatever came along, really th thinking and pondering where I would fit best. And I know that it's, it's really hard in today's climate to wait out, but you're, you're worth it. You all are so worth the job that you can do coming out of this program. And just using all those things and coming together, um, that helps breed effective teaching. Because you will go and in turn show that to the other colleagues at your school sites that you're at. Um, I agree. I think that that was one of the most powerful things that you said as well, talking about um, just the absolute importance of collaboration and building that within your school, taking the time to build that with the other teachers at your school. Um, I was fortunate because I was in the same school as another math teacher from Math for America who also graduated from this program. And so we had a lot of similar, um, with similar ideas about how we teach. And so we had like an automatic built-in collaboration. But then it was so great to also be able to share that with the veteran teachers at our school. And they, I was so surprised when in the first couple weeks of school I had veteran teachers coming into my classroom being like, oh, so that's how you number the desks and you color it this way. Um, <laughs> And being like, wow, you new teachers, you know, you come in with so many great ideas. And then consequently being able to go into their classrooms and learn from them as well and take ideas and um, steal and borrow this from this teacher and this from this teacher. And having, taking the time to build that was so crucial for me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question and perhaps our panel can also address it. Um, and that is the question of curriculum. And you made a very good point about looking at curriculum and looking at something that you could utilize as opposed to something that you might construct or draft. But we have a huge argument here about whether or not. <laughs> Good. Yes. And it's a long-standing argument. So perhaps you could address that a little bit more. Um, there are those of us that believe that prescriptive curriculum creates um, and takes away some of the ingenuity and some of the creativity and the responsiveness to students that we want our students to have. On the other hand, there are those who believe that the prescribed curriculum is a way of learning how to become right. a really good right. teacher. I, I'm not a fan of scripted curriculum, and I'm certainly not um, very tolerant of schools where teachers have to be at a particular moment on this particular page at a particular moment. So I, I'm not suggesting that. But I, when we started this work, I, the Massachusetts um, state test had just been instituted a couple years mm -hmm. before. And there was a, a lot of alarm. And I thought, oh, we're going to go into these schools, and the teachers are going to be angry about the fact that they have to teach the curriculum. And it, in fact, we found their desperation that they did not have a curriculum. So it was more the total absence of it. Um, I, and I, I obviously, I don't think either extreme is necessarily appropriate. But I had, I had one teacher of first grade who they had developed the frameworks in the state. And for some reason, she was supposed to be doing religions of the world with the first graders. And according to the framework. So she was describing to me, in tears, going to the library to try to understand Islam enough so that she could then explain it to her first graders. And this was a person who, you know, she was totally overwhelmed. It was a, it was a ridiculous um, kind of situation. So I think that you get, you know, I, I've been teaching a long time, I'm still doing this, it's just grown ups. And, I still am developing the kinds of skills that you know, take a long time, figuring out the sequence of lessons, figuring out what follows what, and how to pull things together, and what to do with simulations. It's immensely complicated. And so if you start with three or four preps 
and a lot of teachers have three or four preps and no textbook. And there are people who have nothing, really nothing. Um, I, I think that's just a rep recipe for disaster. So I mean, it's not that I think scripted curriculum is good at, at all, um, but there's got to be something. Some of your comments related to curriculum? Well, I, again, I, I think back to the uh, first year I was teaching, and I was in a very interesting position. Um, the school that I teach at is a, an affiliated charter school, so it's partially with the district, and it's partially on its own. And there's a charter that states, you know, these are the, the guiding principles of how we want teaching and learning to occur at our school. And there were district mandates and mm -hmm. charter expectations and it was uh, a bit muddled at times and there were curriculum wars on what what are we going to use and what are we not going to use and I think the biggest lesson that I learned out of all of it was the curriculum is a is a resource and I really had to go back to how I learned how to teach and how to set up learning experiences and how to assess what it was that I was teaching and to go back to um, the standards that we're expected to teach the children. And irrespective, I think, of the curriculum, I, I really tried to look at it as how do I craft quality learning and use that curriculum as a resource as opposed to being bogged down by um, pacing plans or um, the prescriptive curriculum. And it's challenging, and you have to really uh, know what you're doing, and you have to be very uh, confident in yourself, and you have to be confident in your abilities, which you've gained coming out of this program. Um, so that's it was, and it's still challenging. I'll be, I'll be real. It's still challenging, <laughs> but yeah. I, I really like because um, at first when you said that, when you said you don't have to make your own curriculum, <laughs> I, um, we were exchanged eyes, and, um, but, then, but that makes sense. But now I understand it's, um, it's sort of that picking and choosing, for sure, and using it as a resource, as you said. Um, being history and, and we just graduating using um, the teacher curriculum the institute's view on history. And I remember using it for the first time in Professor Kaplan's class. And, thinking, oh my gosh, like I have to do every single step. There's so many pages and you know, I'm turning in my lesson plans and how do I adapt that curriculum to a lesson plan that USC would be on board with? And, and that was overwhelming. And, and <laughs> Professor Kaplan, I'm gonna shout out, she said, no, no, no. You take what works from TCI and you take what, you're, what makes sense for your classroom because all of your 40 students might not be able to get on board with that. But you take what works and you adapt it and you modify and I think it was a hard lesson, but it was a good lesson to learn. And I think that's it kind of has to do with any type of really scripted curriculum. Is it's that fruit basket. If if the banana doesn't work, don't take the banana. Get the apple. Get the orange. Take what what you work that works for you and what's going to work most importantly for your students. I'm a first year teacher, <laughs> and it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's actually something that um, Pam Mason, the director of Math for America, sitting right there, she, that's something she said to us. She goes, don't reinvent the wheel. Like, if, you're, if it is available for you, take it, because otherwise, like you said, you'll never sleep, which is true. So I've done it both ways. I've been like, well, oh, I'm throwing that out the window, and I'm going to make it all myself. And um, it's been a disaster, or it's been a success. Um, and I think for me, what I found, <laughs> so I, I work at a school, I, it's just opened, this is the first year it's been in existence, and they pulled a couple young math teachers on board and said, okay, choose the math books, like, ready, go, you have like a day. <laughs> so we did some research and I frantically called lots of people and we picked some books, and they're okay, you know, but I didn't really know what I was doing, I had never taught before except for student teaching, I didn't, but I was like not that familiar with so many different curriculums. And turns out, you know, the textbooks that we chose were great, but not necessarily for our students because we didn't have a really solid idea of who our students were. Um, 
And I got really nervous at the beginning of the year because I was like, ah, I can't use these textbooks. I don't know what to do. And it was actually really great when I was able to pull from resources that I had gotten from USC and then resources that I had gotten through Math for America and resources from the network of teachers through Math for America and the professional developments and all that um, to just have this kind of army of resources in front of me that I could pull, pick and choose from. And that has been just invaluable because like you said, I can create, I feel like now at this point in the year, I can create a solid environment for learning. I know it works for my students um, and I have a routine and it's working okay. But I also have you know, this resource and this resource and this resource to draw from to create that, like, that perfect little problem to pose to the students. So it's been, I am so thankful for that curriculum because I've had days where I've been just trying to make it completely up on my own and it has turned awry. <laughs> so. But I, I, I do think having um, mentored student teachers for, for many years, you are going to struggle and the That's curriculum true. will help you make sense, but it's a struggle, you know, that's that cognitive dissonance that you have to go through. You, you know, I teach fifth grade and when I moved to fifth grade, I don't know, I didn't know about weather systems. I don't, I don't know how, what high pressure and low pressure are, but you know, you go through that and the curriculum can be that tool and that resource. Um, so don't be a, afraid, I would say, of those challenges that you will face. Um, but I was cleaning out my desk today and I found this manila envelope and it was really, really tattered and beat up. And I'm like, what is this manila envelope? And I open it up and there are all of my notes for when I was the, in the MAT program. I keep them in my classroom. <laughs> I still refer back to the notes on how to create my lesson plans and how to um, navigate through the content areas. So it's challenging, but you do have those skills and you can get through the curriculum. In the last minute that we have, Dr. Moore Johnson, I'd like to ask you a question that maybe would help all of us, and that is I got a call on um, Monday from somebody who was very excited about a job they were offered. And the thing that was excited most- Excited about what? A job that they were offered. Oh, job offered. A, a job that this person was offered. Actually, it was two of them. And among those things that they were talking about that were so exciting was that every classroom had a smart board, that there was many for field trips, that in fact there were brand new <laughs> Xerox machines in what's known as the faculty lounge. But there was two things that were going to happen for them. One, there was not going to be an assistant principal that could help them in any way, shape, or form coming into their room. And secondly, that there would be no money for any kind of induction program. What would you have said to this person in terms of choosing that particular venue for teaching? I would suggest that they spend a little time at that school. Um, that's, I mean, I would say, go looking somewhere else. If it were my own child, I would say this is, smart boards are not smart, <laughs> you know. They're, um, so my, my daughter, when she started, they had laminating machines in her school. Someone had given these laminating machines, and that was kind of the whole thing. Everything that she could find was <laughs> laminating. <laughs> But they also, had, they also had a discipline system school-wide, a sort of behavior thing, one of those red, yellow, green light things, um, which was enormously helpful. So there, you can have a place with smart boards where there is other stuff going on. <laughs> um, the absence of a, an assistant principal, you know, maybe I can imagine it being better off without some assistant principals I know. So, you know, it all kind of depends on what really is going on there. Money for induction, honestly, I would be more interested in knowing what the assignments are. Do teachers work in the fourth grade who aren't all of the same age and experience? So I would always say, ask to spend a day at the school. See what's going on. And if no one wants to talk to you, go somewhere else. You know? <laughs> thank you, and thank all the panel for being here. And thank you very much for your responses to our questions. Thank you. So now you get a chance. Uh, I, I want the panel to stay up here too. I, I will say I think 
Um, I am very proud as the dean of uh, the three of them. They each represent different programs, different uh, experiences, and different, uh, different that some are new and some have been in of the year. And, and Michelle, you're a veteran. <laughs> you're the veteran of the three of them. So uh, what do you want to know? What do you want to ask? You want to tell who you are? Oh, my name is Ronnie Manchester. Uh, just graduated. I wanted to give some advice. You talked about looking for collaboration within the school and with various teachers. Um, I found that you can find a tremendous resource if you look beyond the school as well um, in the community with people that are not teachers, but also in, in the internet, in social networks. So I participate quite regularly in a thing called, everybody should, called Ed Chat, New Teacher Chat, and Math Chat on Twitter. Now that may sound ridiculous to some people, but there are so many really creative teachers on there having very in-depth discussions daily about every topic you could possibly think of. And if you have a lesson plan coming up on X, you can ask about it and get lots of great ideas and responses. So look beyond the walls of the school to can I say something about that? I think that, uh, I mean, the internet, um, you know, I now even say, oh, I have a question, I will ask. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask my iPhone. So um, it is, <laughs> it's tremendous what you can get. What you can't get is the ongoing work with your colleagues. And for the sake of the kids, you need to be working with the other teachers. So not to say that's not a tremendous resource, but I worry that we've become so connected with the outside sources of information that you know it's a way of coping if your colleagues won't have anything to do with you. Certainly, and it's better than not having people. But the children are going through the school grade by grade. And so if we're all teaching them, but we don't know what each other is doing, or there's no relationship among our you know, classes, our approaches, our curriculum, that's a problem. So I, I think that sort of keeping both going would be really important. But I think one thing to add, um, when we talk about effective teaching, when you are able to collaborate and talk amongst your colleagues and, and understand um, how you approach teaching, uh, that will create an environment where you can be more collaborative and you will be more effective. Instead of, it's hard when the students switch, and I've experienced this through looping, so I've kept kids two years in a row, and the ease of transition was amazing as opposed to getting a new class of, of students from three different teachers who do things three different ways who you could tell they never talked once at a grade level meeting. And that, you know, it's sad when you can tell who, what child comes from what classroom. It shouldn't be like that. We should be a community. We should be a school community. And I, I wonder what it would have been like if, when I was in the program, there we had all of this social networking. It wasn't, and that's so sad to say because it hasn't been that long. But we didn't really do those things um, when I was in the program. But it's an amazing resource, amazing resource. But it's all about the relationships too. You got to have those relationships in, at your school site. What else? Yes, over here. Can you, we're recording it, Colleen, so if you'd use the microphone. Hello. Can you hear me? Colleen Dietz, Director of Professional Development in the Rosier School. My question really has to do with your experiences in involving the parents, um, especially both of you who are working in a nice urban environment where parents, you know, don't always have the luxury of having a stay-at-home mom and so on. Can you talk a little bit about the realities of that? It's, it's difficult. It's very difficult, especially when uh, parents speak different languages and uh, parents' schedules are different than what would fit your schedule. But the bottom line is you have to do it. You have to reach out. You need to reach out because the parents have this tremendous voice. And, and what we're learning is that they, they don't, sometimes they don't realize the voice that they have. And it's great that we 
educate the children, but what about the parents who don't understand the way schooling works, traditional schooling even works? So at my school site, actually this weekend, we're having our first ever parent colloquium, and we're giving workshops, and the theme is from um, kinder to college. So we're looking at empowering the parents and helping them understand how to help their children. Because if we're not advocating for the children, the parents are, need to be advocating for the children, but sometimes they don't know how. And it's, it's just really imperative. But it's a difficult, it's a very difficult um, job to do. But I would, I would point out that that school-wide piece is what teachers need. Mm -hmm. um, that y you can do as an individual so much letter writing and calling and mm -hmm. all of it. But if the parents don't feel they're welcome at the school and that the school's not going to contribute to their parenting uh, you know, and their effectiveness, it's really hard. So kind of pushing principals to do something like that is good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Oh. I was just going to add on to that. That's basically what I was going to say. That I, it's been really hard for me at a new school because we didn't really have any infrastructure. Like everything was just kind of systems were being created left and right. Like, oh yeah, we need a system for what happens if we have visitors. We need visitor badges, like things like that. <laughs> so we just hired a parent rep like a week ago. We didn't have that. And so I was like desperately running around to different, different teachers who spoke Spanish and th being like, please, can you call this parent for me? So that's been a real struggle because I didn't, I was, I was kind of like, okay, I need, I need to find my job, <laughs> you know? And that was one of the questions that I was like, okay, well, ah, here we go. I got offered a job. I'm going to take it. Um, and it was, it's been a real struggle for me to figure out ways to communicate with parents when that hasn't really been set up at the school, that infrastructure hasn't been set up. But one of the things that I think is really interesting in some of the research is something that we've omitted a lot in terms of parent involvement, and that is the side-by-side -side learning that parents could do coming into a classroom and actually spending a class time mm -hmm. with their student learning side-by-side, -side, as opposed to parents could be before school or coming after school or on a Saturday. I think it's something that really gives a different kind of connection to what schooling is all about and a shared kind of responsibility that I think has great merit. I'd like to add just a little bit. Um, the because parents are such, you know, they're they're a key stakeholder. What we learned about is you know that and they need to be involved. What I would like to say is with the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the the schools that I student taught at, they had a a system called Teleparent. And I don't know if, if, if anyone's familiar with Teleparent, but it's a way that parents go in, they choose what language um, they'd like to receive the information, and they choose whether they want it as a phone call or an email. And it's an automated system. The teacher goes in and plugs in the comments, and then at the end of the day, all the calls get automatically sent out in the language. And what I found about that is this, the school that, was, that did not have that, my first go-around student teaching in a high school, um, I found myself constantly sending the negative emails. So-and-so is misbehaving, so-and-so is missing a, a lot of assignments. With this new, um, with the teleparent, I found myself, oh, well, there's a positive list right there. I can just click, so-and-so asked a great question today. You know, so-and-so really took a risk and I noticed it. And what I noticed, even for the 10 weeks I was in this school, is I was getting emails back from parents. Thank you so much for letting me know that. It's so nice to hear so-and-so so is very popular, but so-and-so is doing well. And um, so I think in terms of parent involvement, from just my experience, it has to be the good and the bad because they need to know both. Margo. Hi. Um, I have a question about school culture. So many of the things we've been talking about are characteristics of school cultures. And you know, um, I have student teachers sitting in the room that have had to navigate the school cultures that they're student teaching in. And I'm wondering, um, you know, we want to put our teachers out into schools that really need them. And we want to, and some of those schools can be difficult places to work. So. 
while I think you have to choose the best school for you to work in, sometimes you choose the school that's best for you to work in, but also can be a difficult place to navigate the culture of the school. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any advice for new teachers going into challenging schools in terms of making those connections and navigating that culture in a way that they can be most productive in their early years. This is an argument that we have among my colleagues and I about this because it, it's a huge issue. I actually think that new teachers should learn to teach in reasonable settings um, that aren't extreme. That doesn't mean they're easy, but that where it's where everything is not up for grabs and where it's not um, uh, threatening and you know disruptive. Uh, I think more experienced teachers should be in those schools, and unfortunately, that's not the way our school districts are organized. But I, I, um, I think it's a question. If, if you're starting to teach as a two-year commitment, and you're going to give it your all for two years, and you, know, you, can, take, you can be in the Peace Corps, or you can be in a, in a really um, severely um, needy school, you'll, you'll do some good there. But I actually am more interested in people's long-term commitment to the work. And I, I just don't think those are good places to begin. I, I wouldn't, you know, if someone said, I'm really going to do it, I would say, I wish you great luck. But I think what's hard is that there is a kind of obligation. It, when, um, when I first started to teach, I was in an MAT program at Harvard, and I, um, I was assigned to teach in Brookline, which is a fairly wealthy suburb. It turns out that, like all suburbs, it has poor kids in it. But I had wanted to be assigned to, to Boston. And um, one of my professors said, wherever you teach, it's going to be hard. And wherever you teach, you're going to contribute. So don't imagine that you have to be in the most challenging place. And you know, it was hard, but I was, I was working with colleagues from whom I learned an enormous amount. And then I could teach in more challenging settings and with more challenging kids. So I, I, I think it's really difficult, but I guess I want to put that point of view out there, because I think the pressure is so great to save the world immediately in the most difficult situations. Thank you. One more? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm what you would consider, I guess, mid-career, but I've been teaching for a really long time. I uh, attended here at USC back before the internet was invented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question is, to you is, um, from the day I started teaching over 20 years ago to today as I was walking out the door, I love what I do and I've got a passion for it. But a number of my colleagues um, had that great energy when we started and don't have it anymore. And they're frustrated, particularly in today's <coughs> times. They're frustrated, they're overwhelmed, and they're battling apathy as well as anxiety. How do each, and this is directed at the, the teachers, how are each of you going to maintain your enthusiasm, <laughs> your positive nature, in, uh, like Dr. Pinceval, did I get it right? Like she said, when you walk into a school culture, that might not support you. What is your individual plan for yourself on maintaining that? And what would you recommend to your classmates here who are going to be facing the same situation? We had a great education here, but now we have to go out. Well, I've been out for a while, but everybody else has to go out. I ask myself that every day. I, and I, I, in, a, in a very, very serious way, I go to work and I ask myself, why, what are the reasons that I'm here? Why, what is most important to me to be here? Because it's certainly not the paycheck. <laughs> and I, in, I encounter so many challenges and so many difficulties. Yet what is it that keeps propelling me to go through the door every day? And I think you said it brilliantly when it's, it's a love and it's a passion. And whether you <coughs> love children or you have a, an extreme passion for a particular discipline or subject area, like you know, you guys were both saying with theater and with the math, making algebra just make sense. And I, I don't know, I have this thing for math and girls. I just think I love it when girls just really get into math. Um, but it's that passion and that love for teaching that keeps me 
floating above all of the disenchantment that I see and the negativity that I see around me. And especially with these challenging times, nothing's perfect. Nobody said this, this career path would be perfect and I would always have a job and I would always be able to pick the perfect class. Like these classes, these kids are challenging. I'm, I'm just telling you they're challenging. But the moment I give them an assignment and I open up the assignment and it says this, this book is dedicated to Miss McGuire because she inspires me and she helps me learn from the past. I'm sorry, it just like makes you tear up and it makes you keep going and it, it's because of that love and some days you forget about it, some days you have to dig really deep to find it and some days it's, it's right there, right in front of you. So. I have to remind myself every day, it's, I, I love these children, and I love what I do. I think one of the most interesting things that was told to me many years ago by someone who was a veteran teacher, at the time she had been teaching 30 years, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's almost older than I am at the time. But she said something which I'd like to share with you in response to your question, that one of the ways to maintain your enthusiasm for teaching is not to look at what's fixed, but what's elastic. And if you can keep looking at those things that are elastic around you, the things that have stretchability, that have the possibilities, then you can maintain your ability to sustain your effort in that particular you know, profession or that particular school. I, I think it's all about relationships for me. So it means, that means relationships with colleagues and relationships with other friends who are teaching, at least like I, I, I don't, I can't really predict like in the next 20 years if this will still be the same answer. But it's, it's those relationships that sustain me and keep me going. And then also just relationships with students. Like I can have a really bad class period that I'm just like, oh my goodness, my lesson didn't go well, and I feel like I, I assess kids at the end, and who knows really what they came out of it with. Um, but then I'll have an interaction with a student during lunch that just like makes my day. It's like, all right where I'm okay, I'll bounce back, I'll, I can go home and think about the lesson, lesson again and come back with a different plan of attack. And it's all just because um, I, I just love hanging out with students too. I just love it. They're just, they're a blast. So they, they give me a lot of my energy. Well, I was listening to your guys' advice. I'm not, uh, but I, I mean, for me, my, my advice to myself is that, you know, that don't give up. There's an incredible support system if you reach out. Um, I, first week into student teaching, my iPhone got stolen because, from one of my students. And Professor Kaplan's sitting on the phone with me as I'm crying, saying, what am I doing here? You know, like, I'm a, I, how can I keep doing this in my first week? It's already messing up. And all three professors of all, and all three um, classes I was in at the, in that semester, you know, sent me their cell phone numbers and said, call me, let's talk about this. This, you're not, this is one day. And I said, okay, it's one day. I was upset, I was bitter, but I showed up on Monday and we, Mass Teacher and I had a plan of action and we addressed the, the, the class, you know, from our hearts and, I, and, it, was, and it was one day. And it, and it got better and it got over and I, and I thought, Man, if I can handle that, I, I, I can handle this. I, you know, as long as I stay true to myself, and I know that it, I'm human and they're human, that we'll, we'll figure it out. It, there's, there's, no, there's no black and white, there's no brick walls in teaching. It's, I'm, I'm taking elastic, I like that word, so. <laughs> All right, uh, I want to th uh, please ask you to join me in thanking the, uh, our speaker and our panelists. And, and I know if you have that question you want to ask Susan or any of the other uh, panelists up here, let's go out into the courtyard. There's a reception out there and do some one-on-one -on -one relationships. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies.